Yo, 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 I'm Dion the Groma. Um, Chicago, Illinois, that's where I'm born and raised, West Side. Um, I've been a barber for about 30 years, close to 30 years, and I've been really, uh, I would say, uh, deep into it. But as time changed, people changed and techniques changed and a lot of things got easier and some things got harder. I'm most known for the skill set of fading. My fades have, has always been clean and pristine. People always liked them. And uh, as I said, the, I was known for relaxers, the curly relaxers at one point, plus the fade. So sometimes it just adds to your repertoire, but I'm most known for the fade. As far as the, the barber game evolving, I've seen a lot of things. Uh, number one, I saw a lot of things taken for granted. I, I see that they implemented the spraying, which people abuse that. And that's not revolutionary. That's not innov innovative. It's, it's not any of those things good if you can't really cut hair. What it does is it shows people that don't want to do the work. Those are lazy barbers and it's, it's, I think time has created lazy barbers where we once took the time to fade the hair. We didn't give up on the fade until the fade was the way we wanted it. Now these younger guys going on YouTube, everybody want to mix Kiss Express with alcohol and water and they want to spray over their mistakes. Well, think about it. Times has changed to the point where that stuff has become accepted where when I was coming up in the early in the, in the early 80s and the 90s and all the way, you know, some people going to hold you responsible for the way that fade look and they don't want spray. What about somebody that don't want spray? Nice is, is making you become a better barber because now that mistake that you usually or didn't care about doing, you got to you got to care about it now. It got to be a concern of yours. So now, um, with the with the game changing and and getting better, they're creating uh, shortcuts to cutting hair. And I've never been given a shortcut. I've always, when I first started, my first pair of clippers. I don't know where I got them from, but God told me that was that time. I started using these clippers. I broke them. I had to go to Walgreens. <coughs> When I received the next pair of clippers, it they didn't even have an adjuster uh, knob on the side. I had to keep unscrewing them to, to fade ahead. But what I learned and what I appreciate more that when I did get a chance to get a pair of clippers with the fade arm on them, I was appreciative to them. And I just got better. And then I graduated to the Master Andy. That's the number one clipper in my mind. That has been the number one clipper forever since i started using them i was using andy's back in like 81 when when you finish instead of wrapping them up you just unplug the cord uh it's, it's harder now because it's saturated and it's oversaturated with people that don't know how to cut hair they they get a lot of likes on instagram and youtube and people are promoting bad haircuts. So it makes it hard for you and I to really cut hair. So when we'll sit up and do all the work, we, we won't cut corners. We give you a whole haircut before we use any enhancements. I, I've seen on YouTube, and these are people with 500 likes and 20,000 likes. As soon as they put their picture up, they get 14,000 likes. But he's trash. It's garbage. It's garbage cut. But it's disguised with so many different attributes. You got spray. You got fibers. You got things of that nature that hides everything that goes on. So when you get a real barber like myself and Mike and Mike um, from the art gallery, 
what you end up having is a bunch of nobodies that become somebody because of social media. Because we're not there to watch you cut that head. That may be the only haircut you do for two hours and it's trash, but you doctor it up with the spray, you doctor it up with the fibers, and, and it gets so bad, they start doctoring, doctoring it up with uh, Photoshop. Where they putting makeup on people on the pictures to erase blemishes and it's stuff that they do like you stay on the line and too long it turn red or you cut them that shows when you show a good picture that is going to show well what happens is people don't look at that and the one thing that i'm having a problem with that makes it really hard what is this thing about leaving a white line around people's head? I don't know if that's becoming a big thing. I don't do it personally, per se, but it has become a big thing with people leaving that line. And it makes it hard. So when you get a real haircut, you don't want a real haircut from me. I had people leave me for really cutting their hair, letting them see what the whole haircut looked like, and then give them enhancements. But they felt like enhancements should have been something they didn't even ask for. They want it right off the back. And I think enhancements is like dope now. It's like drugs. And people, they are addicted to that look. I have no problem with it. But you're going to pay for it. But people, and another thing that, that changed the game and make, and make the game more harder is that people are undercharging just to get the business. And it makes it harder for you and I to make money if they if we charge fifty dollars starting or we charge a hundred dollars starting they know they're they know in their heart they're not good enough to charge that money so what they do well I charge you 20 and give you the same service but they spray the hell out of you with all this stuff you don't get a real line and most of y'all out there in TV land whoever you are this is going to cut deep. You don't use razors. You don't know how to use a razor. So what you do, you use all that stuff and you move it with, with the clipper blade. You don't move it with a blade, uh, a razor. Hmm. I do. I think enhancements make it so much easier to charge that money that you charge because, once again, that's being innovative. You taking your skill to the next level when you really cut hair for real and then use the, the enhancements. Because what happened is you go from being a regular dude on the street with a good haircut to that guy should be on the cover of a GQ magazine. And I know everybody that's a feel good for people that may struggle with like uh, the way they look. Or the way they feel about themselves. Identity crisis. There's a lot of things that go along with it. Uh, some people don't really look at themselves as being a nice looking person. But with the enhancements, it takes them from zero to 100 because now the compliments come. Mm -hmm. And when with the compliments, bring them back for us to keep servicing them. So that means that that gives us money making opportunities. Number one, we charge them for doing it. And number two, when they come back, they're more apt to, to pay what you tell them. And they tip better when they realize and feel good about the haircut. Because, I mean, we got to be real with each other. Are you going to pay somebody? Or are you going to give somebody some money when nobody's looking at your haircut and, you know, and nobody's paying you any attention? But when somebody say, hey, who cut your hair? Oh, Dion the groomer cut my hair. Or, 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 or Mike cut my hair from art gallery. The first thing people do is they gravitate to what, what look they had and what look you, you give out. So what they perceive you as being is an excellent barber. So what you do, you use that and you stand on that platform of living through what you do, your skill set. So... When people get in your chair, the first thing they do, they say, hey, I want my hair like Larry or Mike, Mark or whoever that, you know, brought them in there or told them about you. They want that same look. And it's easier to give them that look when they come in to get what you know how to do. You know, it's a lot of barbers that don't know how to do the stuff with the um, with the enhancements. And it end up being a tragedy 
because if you look at if you look at their Instagram pages and their Facebook pages, you got clumps and clumps of fibers in places where it shouldn't be. Let me say this to y'all. Enhancements are to only sharpen. It's not to make it look dark in one place. That's when you know you're not using it right. You know, I want to be known. My brand should be excellence. Cutting with excellence. That's what I would want my brand to be. And the reason why is because I put my heart and soul into every haircut. I don't care if you a bum off the street and I'm giving you a charity haircut or you somebody that's somebody in the NBA, which I've cut a lot of those guys here. I want people to say he put his all into my haircut. Now, don't get me wrong. I have screwed up a lot of haircuts along the way, but let me explain what I mean by screwed up. I down myself for things that was wrong with the individual. You know, you got a guy with a hole in the corner of his line because he's receding. I fought myself a lot of times, a lot of years, for not doing what some of these younger barbers started doing. When the, when the hairlines are receding, a lot of the young barbers just go around it and they, and they just cut it out. So instead of you having a liner like I got now, you, they take it and it's a U. And I, I never had the heart to screw somebody hair up like that. I mean, if it's peach fuzz in those corners, I kind of use it and work with it. These younger guys not doing that. They just go straight and cut it off. And I think people are getting doomed and start getting persuaded into believing that that's how it has to be. Now, me, they say I screwed their hair up because I didn't go in there and eat the, eat the lining out. But somebody else can go and tear the whole lining apart. As long as they spray something on it, it looks good. But me, I, I've messed up along the way because I've seen linings, I've seen haircuts that was messed up. The number one thing I said I would never do again, and I've stuck with it over the years, is that go over another person's work and try to make it my own. If somebody screwed you up, then I suggest you let it grow back unless we finna transform it into a haircut that I know can get you to where you need to be. If he screwed up your ball fade and he took it up too high and you come to me saying, hey, I just left the barbershop over here. They screwed me up. The best thing I can do is try to fix the fade and that's it. I'm not putting no signature, no stamp on it because that's not excellence. You looking at somebody else's work, they screwed it up and then you want me to come behind and, and put my finishing touch on it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. I mean, most of the times it don't. I don't want to be one of the people that go behind somebody. And I've, over the years, stopped doing it. So if I had to brand myself, I, I would just call it excellence because that's what I want to be known for. Even if somebody say, I don't like my hair, that doesn't excuse the fact of what I feel or what I know about me. Because I know when that person didn't like their hair, all they got to do is go out and let's don't say a word. Just go out with that haircut and let somebody see what it is. Let me say something. When another person tell you about a haircut that you don't even like on yourself and they tell you that that haircut is nice, it's sharp, it looks good, it fits you. You should listen to that because just because you could get a box haircut or just because you can get a Gumby from back in the day, or just because you can get a ball fade, you got to keep in mind, your head has to match that haircut. It does not mean because you can get it that you should get it. A lot of people are walking around with haircuts. They just don't fit them. So do you blame the barber because you saw this cut on Jamie Foxx and you want it and it don't look good on you? It's not my fault. But we got to take into consideration we're in a, in, in a time now where it's all about the spray and the fiber. So even if you don't like it, one of these young boys going to get you, hold you up against the wall, spray you, 
and you're going to love it. Now when you sweat, it's running everywhere. There's no appreciation for the real haircut. So if you have to brand yourself and you have to call yourself something, I would suggest you want to call yourself something like excellence. That's what I would call myself. Um, personally, I've always wanted to be the boss of everything that I do, own the rights to everything I do, and and control everything that I do. So with that being said, I personally feel like uh, product brands are things that's not really being taken seriously. I think people are just going to companies and I think they're uh, having somebody do stuff for them. But I think tapping into the market of, of, of products, uh, lines of clippers. But the one market that I think that's oversaturated is uh, it's just being a barber itself. That market is just all, it's tapped out. But as far as uh, products, natural products, just not any products, natural products. Those are things that need to be tapped into more because, and the reason I bring that to you is because of this. I got, I got four sons and as infants all the way up into their adulthoods, they're adults right now, except my eight month old. Everything has been chemicals, chemicals, chemicals. But I noticed when I start using natural things on them, like coconut oils and different things like lavender you know you start using those things on them i think that market is absent in the in the industry of hair because everybody looks at things and everybody wants instant gratification and some of these these uh these ingredients these natural ingredients don't give you that right away and i think that's why people shy away from them but it, everything that you do take time. Some things are instant, you know, and I, but I think the natural industry is shied away from. And I think that's a market where the barbers need to start tapping into. You know, I think that it helps when you know what to put on your client and for what reason you're putting on, putting it on them. If, if somebody has a dry skin, I think find out what natural product can be used on them instead of trying to figure out what chemical you could put on them. I notice people get a lot of razor bumps and things like that. When you get them, instead of running to the tin skin or some of that stuff, try to kind of, you know, use coconut oil, grab something that could really, you know, help them. But a lot of people want something overnight. I mean, alcohol is fine to just clean the skin, but, you know, find something you can really wash your skin with that'll keep it with its natural tone, natural luster, instead of you having to put a chemical on there. So I think natural is the way to go. Because I love what I do, I don't think I really have a per se ideal client, but my client I want I want a respectable client. My my ideal client ideal client is somebody that understand the responsibility of what I do and understand what I'm worth. That's my ideal client. He could be 18 years old, but if he understand my worth and what I do, then that's my ideal client. He can say, "Hey, I want this this and this," and if he can pay for it and he understand that service, then that's my client. That's my ideal client. Not someone that want to negotiate the price. Not someone that feel like they could go down to Gucci and pay them $5,000 for a pair of pants, a belt, and a shirt. But now you want to negotiate with me. That's not my client. Because the first thing I'm going to tell them, I'm not going to charge you less. I don't sell haircuts. I sell services. So... You're a good client, but you're just not a client for me. Because if I charge $150 for a service that you want me to render to you, then I think that $150 is well worth it. Gucci ain't showed you nothing but something that they printed out in Paris 
and you buying in too. I'm actually doing the work in your face and I can't even get what I'm worth. So my ideal client is somebody that can afford me. Generally, I think we need to take it back to the old school. Word of mouth, we need to start talking more because that builds skill set with communication. Number two, people need to start passing out cars again, get back into the habit of communicating again, uh, being able to approach people, learning who people are. Uh, and I think people need to study people more, find out who they would rather deal with opposed to who they wouldn't want to deal with. And I think uh, getting back into the realm of thinking that you know, every client is important and, and, and start getting to work early and stop thinking that you could do banker's hours and think you, you know, you're going to last in the industry. Because by being oversaturated with barbers and the predominantly, of I mean, the majority of y'all don't even have license. If you took the time and asked most of these guys, do you have a license? I bet he tell you no. And if he don't tell you no, He's not going to present them. He's going to throw you off and tell you some other stuff that's going on. I think my personality type, I'm outgoing, caring. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm more caring and outgoing than anything. I, I, I really feel that I'm helpful. I think I do more for my client than my client do for me. I, I don't mind because I think what the client has showed me over the years is how to treat them. But I think what the client also showed me is how I want to be treated as well. So I think I'm an outgoing guy. I think I'm a, I'm a caring guy. I'm, more res I'm, I'm responsible. As, as the industry has changed, I had to get more responsible. When I started using chemicals, I had to become more responsible. So I, I care about what my clients think of me. I care about what my clients think about the service I render to them. I think those are important things. And I think if you got a loving and caring heart, that you would probably, probably be one of those barbers that put more into the craft than what the craft pay out. Mm, by not imp improving his skill set, by not going out, learning new techniques, seeing what the trends are, doing more things that they could do. Um, I think most barbers get burnt out when they stuck in the, in, stuck in the mud with just cutting hair. They don't relax. They don't do facials. And I think too personally communicating. If you don't know how to communicate, that's going to always burn you out because you can't keep talking about sports. You can't keep talking about politics. You can't keep talking about religion because those are factors that get rid of people with these because everybody not Christian and everybody not Muslim. So those are things that you got to really consider when you're thinking about being burnt out. What can you bring to the game? What can the game give you? What can you cash in if you said, I don't want to do this anymore? Can you say, hey, I'm going to get this to this kid over here? A lot of people don't get that. You know, they, they don't have that to give away because they so burnt out. Because the number one reason most people get burnt out because they're doing it for money. They're not doing it for the love. I started off, uh, I was paying people to cut their hair. And then all of a sudden it flipped. I started getting paid for cutting people hair. And the only way that could have worked unless I love what I do. So if you don't love it and you in it for the money, you'll be burnt out quicker than you know it. And then you got some instances where people like me that's been doing it for over 30 years that get tired of it. Don't They want to do something else. And the reason why is the clients make you feel that way. You try to take away my worth. You, you tell me my haircut starting at $50. I'm, I'm lousy. I'm wrong for that. But anybody on their job want to raise? I couldn't stay at $10 forever. So now that I'm charging 50 and up, you can't see it. But when I was charging $10,
you would tip me five because you knew you was underpaying me anyway. But I just think that goes with the game. It, You know, at one point, I started feeling like I was being burnt out because I was doing so much and was getting so little for everything that I was doing. I mean, think about it. I'm doing your hair. I'm cutting your hair for $50. I'm doing $100 worth of work. You Now you want to negotiate at the end of the haircut and say you only got $40. If you go through that year after year, eventually, you're going to say, I'm done. I don't want to do this no more. But I put my big boy drawers on and I said, you know what? Nobody's going to run me from this business. Nobody's going to take nothing from me. Because I put the time in. I went to school. I did all that stuff. So nobody's going to take this from me. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take control of what I want. So either you pay me what I want or you find a new barber. And it had to become that way in order for me to say I got stand power and I'm not burnt out. Learn new skill sets. So I'm going to say this. It's a lot of people that that I look at and I'm thankful for over the last couple of years that helped me recover. Number one, uh, Michael Banks. I'm going to say his name not because he's the one behind the camera or anything. Uh, he was innovative when I met him. He showed me things. I had moved from having a barb, a big barber shop, to moving to a suite. He showed me how the suite life go. He showed me how to deal with things in the suite. Then he showed me some of the skill sets that I had missed. You know, I had re I had retired myself in a bubble and was like, look, they gonna get a haircut. That's all I'm doing. I'm not doing nothing else because they don't want to pay for nothing else. But when I got over there, I realized before I, now I got to keep in mind, this what happened when I left and went over to the suite. Before I left the suite, it's a guy by the name of Mike Jeezy. Uh, that's my boy. I, 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 I was on Instagram one day and I saw the work he was doing. I'm like, man, how is he doing this? How did he get this done? How did he get that done? So I got on Instagram and, and, and inboxed him. He hit me right back. Me and him went to talking. Right now, he's one of my closest friends. We talk every day. And he showed me a lot of what had happened and that I had missed. See, because once you put your, when you start getting burnt out, you stray away from the world. What happened when you're getting burnt out or you're getting close to being burnt out, you, sw you sway away from the world. You don't want to learn nothing else. You don't want to do nothing else. You cutting hair, you going home. But I never in my heart wanted to just be that kind of barber. So I, I was like, one day, I was like, God, what's the next step for me? Because this can't be it. This can't be it. He said, get on Instagram. I was on Instagram, and I didn't even get on Instagram. I had just started learning about it and messing with it. So I seen Mike Jeezy. I called, I texted him, I asked him what was up. Man, he said, come by my shop, meet me. He way up north. At Fat Phase, I went up there, the man sat me down, and this is a guy that's younger than me. And said, hey, this is what's happening now. This is what you need to be doing. This is what you shouldn't do. This is what everybody wants now. This is not what they want anymore. So since that happened, I realized my time from the 80s and the 90s was up. That it was a new, it was a new thing happening. So what I did, I just took on what he showed me, and I skyrocketed, and I took off. He was like, hey, and there was another guy named Greg. He's a uh, Greg Davis, the photographer. You can look him up. Greg told me, he said, when I first met him, it was right after I met Mike Jeezy. He was like, hey, your time is everything. That was a, he was a new client. He was like, your time is everything. He was like, people got to pay for that. That's precious. Man, I started using that. So but between Mike Jeezy and Greg Davis, those things took me to higher heights. But what took me over the top when I got over to Phoenix Salon Suite, I met Michael Banks from Art Gallery Studios. He told me, he was like, hey, you gotta put more, uh, so you gotta get into social media. You gotta start using that as a platform to draw people to you. So what I did, I used that. But not only did I use it, he held classes, I went to every class. Then he flipped the script again and he gave me a class on his platform and showed me how I really go. 
So those three people, one, one is not a barber, but he's a photographer. But those are the three people that was the major factors in the change in me in the 2000s. Your mind. Well, it's a lot of them, so I learned a lot from a lot of them. <laughs> some of them are, are stars in their own right. Some of them, some of them think that they the king of Chicago. Some of them think they they the best barbers in the world. But when I sit up and look at their work, I say, "What you pay people to be your friends on Facebook, Instagram, or you pay people to put the likes on your stuff because you you you're purely trash." Then you got all these people you taking pictures with them like you the king or you take pictures with them like you, you know, because I see a lot of barbers do this. It ain't just one bar. I see a lot of barbers do this. They take pictures with all the good barbers and then they, they post them as if they one of those guys. And all you got to do is look at the haircut that you post on Instagram or Facebook and you should say, I'm ashamed of myself that I even let people know that I'm trash like this. Trash. I'm saying it to your face. Trash. But the thing is, people like you so much or they like them so much. They're not going to call them trash, but they laugh behind their back. But I see so many people show me what not to do. It's this one guy in particular. I see him and I be like, this man think he he cold, but the stuff he posts, it really should be shameful. But that's what I mean by the industry that changed. I remember in the 80s and 90s, it was a guy named Nero. It was a guy named Carl King. And it was a guy uh, named Marquette. And it was this older guy named Will had a shop called Hair Castle. I looked up to them guys. Why? Because they did the work. I don't give a damn who you are. Those guys that I named, Nero, Quet, Carl King, Will, they did the work. And those guys will tell you, and I'm sorry, and one more guy named Todd. Todd. Todd, they all worked at Hair Castle. I went down my quit didn't work in hair house, but I used to go down there and ask them a million questions as a young guy, and they gave me the answer. But one guy stood out, his name was Marquette. He told me, he said, I said, man, I'm having a hard time getting this line out the head. He said, Why well, did you put the line in? I said, with the with the with the liners. He said, Well then you get it out with the, the same way you put it in, you get it out. I learned that. And I took that and I said, you know, I'm going to carry that with me through life. If I'm going to be a barber, that got to be one of my strategies. I, how you put it in is how you get it out. And my quit, I thank you for that. Carl King, same thing. Good advice. Uh, uh, Nero, same thing. Good advice. But Will was the king of persuasion. Even if your haircut didn't look good, he'll persuade you, talk you into it, and get you where you need to be. Now, I didn't say he couldn't cut. But, but he was the type of guy you wanted to be around him because you wanted to know what he knew. I used to go over there and watch what he did. And to me, he was certified. And those guys that I just named, they all, they all knew who he was. Now, you got your people at Price Barbershop. You got all these other guys at you know, these other shots, but I'm telling you, in Chicago, in the late 80s, early 90s, Nero, Carr, King, Marquette, and, and Will from Hair Castle, that's what you was going to tend with, and then you got the young gunner coming up the rear, which was me, and um, from, from what I knew about them guys, I learned how to uh, go behind them and do some of the things that they wasn't doing, and I started winning contests with it, so... And big ups to those guys. First of all, what are you cutting for? Are you cutting for the money or are you cutting for the love of it? Because if you're cutting for the love and you're not cutting as good, it's going to still look better than that trashy barber 
that's spraying and putting deodorant all on people's foreheads and finding these new ways to look foolish. If you cutting for the love, what's going to happen is you're going to keep watching, you're going to keep learning, you're going to keep taking in knowledge. And that knowledge eventually, after it builds up and the skill set becomes good and it get, it get better than it was, it's going to project in your work. So don't worry about not being as good as the next person because let me tell you something. There's, there's clients that don't want the sharp look now. Don't get me wrong. There's some, there's some clients that say, hey, I don't, I don't want to look like Hollywood. I just want a haircut. And that might be your ideal plan. But for you trashy barbers that's running around here doing all that stuff, you make it hard for a guy that's up and coming or that, that don't have that polished look yet. You make it hard for that guy to want to ex expand and, and, and broaden his horizon because there's so many of y'all opposed to the guy that's not so good that's trying to learn. Y'all y'all outweigh the, the, the ones that want to learn with the garbage. So my advice to you is just keep working for the love of the game. Don't do it for the money. You're going to get paid regardless, but don't do it for money. What defines a good barber? Take a responsibility for what they're doing behind that chair. It's looking at you, understanding who you are, because your personality play a big role. So looking at who you are, what you get every week, or even if you're a new client, trying to figure out what best fits you, asking questions and making sure they execute it well and not looking for validation from other people, but better yet, looking for, from it, looking for it from the individual that's in the chair. Because you got to remember, once those clippers get to moving, you're responsible for everything that go on behind the chair. It's on you. So if a person go out and say, well, this, this Dion the Groomer did this, there's nothing I can get mad at. Whether they say, oh, that's trash. There's nothing I can do about that. I'm the one did the work. But if somebody say, who did that? Man, that's a nice haircut. That's, that's because you took ownership. You took responsibility for what you put out. Because if you was going to put out garbage and you knew you was going to put out some garbage, I'm pretty sure you would have second guess that or second thought that but it's a lot of guys that the the industry made them feel like what they do is okay so you put a ball spot right here so no nah, don't worry about that spray over it now in two days the ball spot is showing like never before because the, the spray is gone now people say, who cut your hair my hair only been cut for two days but i had a ball spot well what should i do First, start by not going back to that dude. But Hollywood is everywhere now, you know, so it's kind of hard. You got 10-year-old kids getting getting air guns, and they just going to work. <laughs> they ain't doing nothing. They just going to work. So you just, they, I mean, I could get a kid a pass, but you're a grown man walking around doing this. You know you, you bogus. Number one, skill set of listening. It's not even the skill of touching a person and fading their hair. Listening. Because people tell you specifically what they want. And then, being a good listener, you have to be quiet and quit trying to in, in impose what you think on them and let them tell you. Now, if it's something you don't agree with, you show them a different way. Like I had a guy, he told me something that I couldn't understand. He said, I want to, I want to, I want to fade. I want a light fade right here and, uh, just, just, uh, just cut the top down. How low do you want the top? You want a one, you want wavelength. And now keep in mind, this guy had a big old curly box. He was like, just cut it, cut some of it off. If I didn't ask specific questions about that top, 
I could have took a one and went through there and that, that would have been his haircut. That is not at all what this guy wanted. He wanted his top shaped up, but he told me to cut it down. So being a good listener, communicating, it changes everything. So what I had to do, I put myself in his shoes. I said, okay, if I didn't know how to describe what I wanted, what questions would I want this guy to ask me? Okay, now, are you sure you want your hair cut down? Now I'm using my finger as a measurement tool. Do you want this much? Do you want that much? Come to find out, this guy didn't even, he didn't want to cut off at all. But because he didn't know how to communicate with me, and I was being a good listener, I understood that he didn't know. So being a good listener, take you to higher heights. Do you need to be popular on social media to have a solid business in this industry? No. No, I don't have to be popular on social media. I just want to get paid for what I do. So, uh, and I'm saying I ain't being cocky, but I'm, I'm from the NBA to the NFL to the streets of Chicago, from the drug dealers in the federal penitentiary, the millionaires, I didn't cut them all. And you may not have, you probably ain't never heard of me, but I didn't cut them all. And before y'all trashy barbers got them, they was getting real haircuts, and they was coming to me. Guess what? Stop banking on people liking you on social media to get you to make money. Because they're going to deter you. Because there's going to always be somebody on there that looks good or haircut look good. But you got to remember, it might have took him 30 hours to get that cut. It take me 30 minutes. I'm done. And you're going to get that same haircut. So it's all about the skill set. So don't, 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 don't pay attention to that. That don't, social media can ruin you. If you're looking for likes, you can buy those. I don't buy them. But it's all about what you do. If you're not getting paid, it doesn't matter what you're doing on social media. Social media is not going to feed your kids. Is that... You need so many likes to be a good barber. Number one. Number two. People think that uh, you got to hang around popular barbers to be accepted in the industry. And uh, the third one, I would say um it's a myth about being the coldest barber. There's no such thing. The coldest barber is your barber. First of all, um, don't get caught up in the hype of the streets, number one. Number two, keep everything business. And number three, love your client no matter where he come from. Whether he come from the the, the streets of, in the gutter uh, to the NBA or to the NFL. Love them and treat them the same way because uh, you never know who you might have to fall back on. I think me leaving this earth and, and people, one thing I want people to know about me is that I gave it my all every single day and that I cared about each and every individual no matter what it was. I care about what people think. People lie and say they don't care what people think. That's a lie. I care what people thought about me because my profession depended on that. So if you gave me a bad name or you said bad things about me, it kills the fact that I feed my kids and live by what I do. So I do care about what people say about me. I've always cared about what people said about me. And if I ever did anything to anybody that they didn't like, I always try to, to mend that with peace or love, some type of togetherness. But I never let you just walk away from me saying, I don't like that guy. And, and me say, I don't care if he don't like me. To a certain extent, we all get calluses on our heart for the madness that people present to us. But at the same time, if you eat by your hands, your skill set or what you do behind them, behind this chair, 
with these Clippers, you should care about what people think about you. So the main thing that I want people to always know is that I loved and cared about every client and I treated them as if they was a family member or a close friend or something. I always gave you that warm sense of security to know that I dealt with you and that me and you had something in common. You know, I may not ask a lot of questions sometimes. Me going to school for psychology was one of the things that I learned and I had to learn how to read body language. So a lot of times I wouldn't even talk to certain clients. They'll come in, I had to gauge them, get to know if he having a good day. You know, I've been told I don't feel like talking. You know, and I say, hey, how you doing, man? How, how your day been going so far? I don't feel like talking. And you know, instead of taking it personal, except that he just don't feel like talking. It ain't nothing personal towards you. But if he's a person just like you, before he get out that chair, you're gonna say, hey man, that wasn't about you. I'm just in deep thought or whatever. And you, and your words should be like, it's okay, man. No big deal. And he need to feel comfortable about coming back. No matter how that felt to you. Cause it's never personal. Y'all doing business. And at the end of the day, people should know Man, I know I wasn't right the way I treated Dion, but barbers are somewhat of a doormat, you know, because we get dumped on every day. People tell you that their life ain't going as good. Some of the main things they tell you is that they can't really afford the haircut, or if they can, they're not going to be coming for long because their job finna close down. We're a dumping mat, you know, but we have to be smart enough to understand that it's not personal, it's just business. And you can't keep taking it home with you day in and day out. It was days I used to take that stuff home with me and felt bad. Like, man, I had to go off on this guy. I never felt good about that. Because this is not what this industry is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be, out, be about uh, love, caring, the occupation of creativity. You know, and sometimes you can get away from that because... The creativity go out the window, people start becoming in common place with you, and then they stop looking at you as their barber. Now you're their friend. Now they don't respect you the same way no more. So now when you tell them certain things can't happen or you can't do certain things in my shop or it turns personal, like, oh, he coming at me like that. No, if we keep it business, then we don't have to do that. I went to a barber and I expressed that to him. I said, I like what you're doing. His name Michael Banks. I said, man, I like what you're doing. He was like, what you talking about? I said, the fact that you keep it business, you don't talk a lot, you don't, you know, we, but we two different people. But I should have took that when I was younger and stayed that way and just talked enough to engage because it gets to a point where people get too personal with you. They don't respect the craft and they don't respect the business. It's almost like this is just for fun. But my legacy is, is that I cared about everybody. I gave you my all every time. I stepped behind that chair and before I left, I made you feel like you was family. So no matter what you say about me, that's how I treated you. What's your favorite meal? Um, I'm a fruit man myself. I love fruit and steak. Fruit and steak? Yeah. Favorite shoe? Nikes. I love all Nikes, all kinds. Some of them don't feel as good, but I'm a Nike man. Nike. Favorite sport? Basketball. Favorite team? Uh, Bulls. Michael Jordan era. Best vacation? Uh, Jamaica, uh, and Disney World with my wife. Uh, favorite restaurant that every barber should go to? <laughs> well, that, that's hard because every barber ain't making the same money. But Capital Grill, Capital Grill is one of my favorite restaurants. Favorite pastime? Sitting in the house on Wednesdays and Sundays and Wednesdays with my wife and my son. Uh, worst experience in a barbershop? 
uh, somebody came in and robbed me. <laughs> they came in and took all our clothes. All right. Yeah. What's well, kind of the best moment in the barbershop? Um, I have a lot of those when people tell me, they, ex they express to me that they love what I do and that, you know, they've tried all these different people and can't nobody get it like I got it. Now, keep in mind, these are people that left me and came back. Nice. So. Dion, thank you, man. For, no problem, for no problem. There's a lot of gems in here. There's a <laughs> lot, lot of gems in here. Uh, yeah. And um, we, uh, we want to make sure that, that everyone knows how to get in contact with you. Yes, sir. A barber for mentoring, or whether it's a client for a cut, or a barber that want to experience what you got to offer. Right. Um, and I uh, will be hearing more from you. And um, I always appreciate you. All right. Thanks, man.